from IIT Delhi and it is an honor to host you everyone uh, on this uh, session on knowledge management. Um, together with me, I have a fantastic team uh, starting from uh, Mr. Justin to Mr. Ank Ankur, Mr. Akhilesh, Mr. Raghav and Mr. Sunil and we really look forward to having a fantastic session on how carry home a food, our takeaway foods, like the packaging of food itself, the transportation of food itself, the ease of importing and exporting of food is increases, it has increased like never before, particularly post corona, we are all looking forward to healthy food, we are all looking forward to food which is tasty, balanced, uh, less adulterated, more traceable, so um, not to take too much of space between you and my eminent panelists, I would uh, start the panel discussion and to begin with, I have Mr. Justin. Uh, he is Member of Parliament of New South Wales, Australia. And uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Justin, he works on interdisciplinary uh, food technologies and also he is a prominent person who connects industry with academia and find out the way, what is the need of industry and how academia can provide a lab or a controlled level research. He also work on the role of government on promoting the food sector. Now being a member of parliament, uh, we all know that he has a bird's eye view and bird's eye view gives you a very different perspective. So um, again, I would invite uh, Mr. Justin just to share his views upon how emerging technologies are uh, becoming the doorstep to the future and how industry academia linkage can actually uh, be a vehicle on which the emerging technologies can be transformed or transferred to the future generation. So, Mr. Justin, over to you. Kavya, thank you. And thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today. Sustainability. These are significant drivers that are going to impel us uh, to take on innovation. And from my perspective, so Kavya, so in, within the New South Wales Parliament, I have a shadow ministry role in skills, uh, vocational learning and higher education. Uh, so from my perspective, what is a, a key theme for me is around connection, connection between industry and research, uh, and then research back to commercialisation and those pathways and how we can make sure that we are um, from a government perspective, facilitating that. Uh, and also, uh, collaboration. And when I speak of collaboration, uh, from my perspective, again, it is domestically, again, between uh, industry and research. So in the Australian context, uh, we have developed institutes of applied technology, which bring together in the same the same ecosystem, the same space, the same physical space we bring together, uh, vocational learning, higher learning, research and industry, all based within the one building. Uh, and from that we're able to drive innovation because we have the connectivity between industry and the needs of industry. Industry is there telling research this is what we are interested in. But you're also harnessing the power of your, un of your universities and Albie, I'm sure you could speak more of that in that regard, but with 1,000 plus universities across India, there is that opportunity of saying, how do we harness, uh, when it comes to food processing and food technology, how do we harness that knowledge? And that's, I think, an important role that governments can play in that regard in making sure we've got that connectivity. Uh, so happy to explore that a little bit further, but for me, uh, collaboration, and I think collaboration and partnerships between countries as well, and I'm happy to speak to that a little bit more, uh, but that's uh, important things from my perspective. There, Justin, I would aim to fetch the results, uh, including like there are several verticals you need to comply to. Let us say you have to comply to environment, you have to comply to water, then food safety, then um, con consumability, then also allergies. So, uh, how regulatory um, step uh, you think is equally important when you when you speak of collaborations? And then you speak of regulation also. So where does it actually uh, amalgamate or where does it merge together? I, I think that it refers to that there are distinct roles there that government needs to play. And regulation is uh, a crucial space. And take your field of artificial intelligence. Again, we know that there is 
so much positivity to harness when it comes to artificial intelligence. How, from a government perspective, do we make sure that there are the appropriate safeguards around the artificial intelligence, that it is performing the role that we would like to see it to do without the, uh, without, and, and in mitigating negative consequences in that regard? It's, it can be challenging for government. I think one perspective there in that regard is to make sure that you, again, are listening to the stakeholders, listening to industry, listening to academics, uh, again, from the Australian, Australian context, uh, within Parliament, within New South Wales Parliament, we will have committees of inquiry. And I think, uh, again, if there was something to express in that regard from uh, stakeholders in the food processing industry, make sure you are engaging with those committees of inquiry because at the end of the day, they are um, generally non-partisan, which uh, I don't know about Indian politics, but from an Australian perspective, if you've got non-partisan situation or bipartisan, that's that's very important because I think, again, an important thing, aspect for government is to give certainty and assurance. And so you do want to drive change and regulation that is that is going to be consistently applied and not going to change from, from one change of government to another. But committees of inquiry is a process of identifying to hear from stakeholders and to bring that in so that 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 is then being employed by ministers and their officers in, in determining the right regulation to go forward. Uh, but the challenge is, is that there is a real risk uh, with any regulation or with any legislation around unintended consequences, uh, unintended impacts, and that's something that we've got to be very mindful with, particularly as we deal with disruptive technologies as they flow through into society. Thank you so much, Justin. And it's very important to uh, realize the role of a regulator, to uh, to realize the role of a parliamentarian, uh, where he knows that he has to approve things for the benefit of greater good, for the benefit of public. But at the same time, he has to put his regulator's hat on. So, um, continuing the same uh, enthusiastic discussion, we come to a very pertinent speaker, uh, Mr. Akhilesh. He is a manager at Startup India. He's a BTEC and MTEC from IIT Mumbai, and he's a sector lead for food process sector and market dynamics uh, at Startup India. So, uh, Akhilesh, we would like to know from you that uh, how do you think that uh, food, food technology or food processing ventures are a new players in Startup India game? Because till now, most of them we have seen uh, corona time took most of the startups to be making our essential uh, medical kits or PPEs hand sanitizers, and then there is a shift. Food comes under the pleasure and the luxury. So um, how do you drive that? Are more and more startups coming in the food sector? Are they uh, product-based, technology-based, emerging technology-based? How do you really bracket it up at, at your place? Thank you for startups for the factory. It was uh, launched by Honorable Prime Minister Sir back in 2016. Mm -hmm. And since then, uh, it has sort of played a pivotal role in the Indian startup story uh, that has been built over years. Uh, to Ma'am's question, in terms of food processing sector, uh, I'd like to start off by giving a few facts. So basically, currently, if we see the startup ecosystem across the country, we have more than uh, 4,000 startups in the food processing ecosystem. Uh, interestingly, we see that majority of these startups are coming from tier 2, tier 3 cities. Unlike the other uh, startups that we see in IT sector or other emerging technology, food processing startups are majorly based out of tier 2, tier 3 cities in the country. Uh, almost 60 to 70 percent of these startups are operating from uh, tier 2, tier 3 cities. We also see that uh, the food processing startups are spread across, across the country, covering more than 550 districts uh, from the country. Uh, which sort of also speaks about how food processing as a sector is very much dependent on the agriculture sector. Uh, and the main supply chain or the value chain, the sort of, you know, coming from the rural to the urban space and tier two, tier three cities are sort of the hub for getting those uh, food processing done and then essentially the market is in the urban areas. So these trends uh, enable us to see that dynamics playing out. Uh, what we as Startup India essentially, our role is to facilitate these startups, to help uh, startups across all sectors. In food processing uh, sector, we essentially 
try and identify a few startups, help them with opportunities to get the right market access, be it national or international, uh, giving them the right opportunities to showcase their products. We keep organizing grand challenges, hackathons with different ministries. And uh, a few of our grand challenge winners are also exhibiting in the Mokfi Pavilion. And uh, if, if, you would, if you guys would have uh, gone and seen that, uh, they are there essentially because of the facilitation provided by Startup India, which essentially uh, is sort of a government push to the ecosystem that uh, this is a sector that we identify as growing. Uh, this is a sector we see that has a lot of potential. And uh, it is imperative that we provide the right push to the ecosystem uh, so that these startups flourish. There's already uh, fire ignited in the entrepreneurs of the country. Uh, you know, and we just have to let that fire uh, burn more freely, essentially, and not be a bottleneck, but rather be someone who essentially helps spread that uh, fire. So, Great. So, uh, Akhilesh, we would also like to know about, since the topic is uh, um, about startups, and then we are also touching a bit up about emerging technologies. So, how do you think that the emerging technologies, particularly for predictive analysis or for artificial intelligence, machine learning, blockchain, uh, these can uh, help in market-driven dynamics for a startup because uh, eventually they require market and then they require a bit of position of the market. So how do you think that we can uh, merge these two uh, sectors, having startup fortified by the technology so that there is a good amount of market created? So what dynamics you would explain to uh, Ma'am, I think there's a lot of plethora of opportunities if we combine the food processing sector with the technologies that are emerging. Uh, one, technologies can definitely be used to identify or leverage more markets, uh, basically tapping into the right demand that is being generated or what is the right demand for which the startup should target. I think technology is being used in that front a lot by all of these startups and food processing can also use this. In case of food processing, uh, the emerging technologies, or I would like to say more sort of uh, technologies which are more science-based technologies can be used to help uh, develop such products which are, uh, let's say, more in the nutrient value, more convenient for the end user, which are essentially more accessible or uh, have a higher shelf life. So these are very emerging problem statements that we want solutions for and more products in the market which technology or science-based technologies can be used to solve these things. For example, if we see our country, the western side is very dry and hot, whereas the eastern side is very dry and humid. The southern side is very humid all the time. So we are facing different climatic conditions and places that we want the processed food to be able to sustain to those uh, conditions. So hence technology and research should go into these areas where we can tap into uh, these markets and a, a very big opportunity for startups actually lies in solving these problem statements where they are able to use technology to upgrade the quality of food products that we have, give them higher nutrient value, higher shelf life and more convenience for the end user. Uh, just last quick question, Adhilesh. Uh, uh, since there are many budding startups sitting here and many young entrepreneurs who would like to venture into uh, the food area, how do you think uh, Startup India can provide them the platform or they can leverage the existence of Startup India? Can you just uh, Sure, ma'am. Uh, so actually, uh, as Startup India, we essentially handhold startups in a lot of verticals. There are a lot of uh, funding schemes, uh, there are seed fund schemes, there is fund of fund schemes. Uh, there is tax exemptions provided to DPIT recognized startups and uh, essentially uh, all of the entrepreneurs can leverage those benefits once you are a DPIT recognized startup. So if you uh, are doing something which is innovative, scalable or generating employment or wealth, which is sort of a very broad spectrum, uh, you can definitely yourself go and register on the DPIT platform, get yourself recognized. It's a very easy process. The uh, turnaround time is three to six days to get your DPIT certificate if everything is submitted right. And after that, you are open to all of these standard uh, benefits. You can apply to these programs and schemes. Uh, moreover, if you are someone who is actually doing great, you know we would definitely want to showcase you at national and international levels. 
So all these types of support and help is there. It's just that you have to uh, just once and come and knock on the door by just getting yourself rec <coughs> recognized as a deep IT startup. Thank you so much. So um, having a bit known about the government perspective, the regulator's perspective, we also came to know how the uh, government is extending its arms to welcome the young budding entrepreneurs and giving you enough platform on Startup India. I'm very sure many of us would like to leverage this platform and now we have Mr. Akhilesh who is going to definitely help us out. So now once our uh, base for launching our startup is ready, let us find a place where we can actually mass produce it and none other uh, place than a cloud kitchen. So uh, we have Mr. Agar Joshi from uh, Cloud Kitchen and uh, he is going to speak, he's going to give us a presentation. So he's going to speak about how uh, the emerging technologies including Cloud Kitchen can help the food processing sector, can be the uh, food distribution processing development sector for the future. In fact, it is right at the doorstep, it is not even a distant future. Many of us who are working and carry, take, uh, like pick up meals, we know where they are made and we would definitely like to buy something which is quality processed. So, uh, hearing it from none other than Mr. Raghav Joshi. Uh, to our cloud kitchens, we focus on delivering food across various brands uh, to people all over uh, India in 70 plus cities. Um, we are about 10 years old, uh, we had the privilege of becoming a unicorn in 2021 and uh, we believe that you know, like shopping has moved online, like watching entertainment has moved online, uh, ordering food and eating in is also a trend you know, that, is, that is here to stay. Right? Earlier we would all go to malls together as families and friends, we would, uh, would shop, um, and uh, watch a movie and then eat in the food court, right? Now we shop online, now we watch movies on Netflix, Amazon Prime, etc. And the same is happening in food also, right? I'm sure all of you here would have ordered a lot from Swiggy, Zomato and uh, you know, uh, Domino's and some of our brands also like Behrut Biryani and Aman Story. I'll try to keep it a little interactive for the group here and I would start with a question. <coughs> What factors will never change for the customer while ordering food? Like what do you look for when you when you order? What do you look for? Do you look for taste? Do you look for great packaging? Do you look for good value? Do you look for faster delivery? Look for healthy options. Faster delivery? Price, quality? Ease of ordering? Taste. Yeah. So great inputs. And you know what what we essentially at Rebel also and I know so many other restaurant chains, what we focus on are things are not the changing consumer trends, but rather things which are never going to change. And the things that are never going to change, we call them SQVC, which is selection, quality, value, and convenience, right? Selection means variety of cuisines. In each cuisine, a lot of options. In each option, a lot of depth. For example, if you want to order a cake. First of all, you want to see five cake brands. Then you want to see uh, in each brand 10 different <coughs> options of cakes. And then for each of those options, you want to see a half kg cake and a one kg cake and likewise, right? So that is selection. The more selection, the better. Sometimes the selection becomes too much and it becomes difficult for us to you know, decide. So it has to be a sort of a balance. Quality, I think it's, it's uh, self-explanatory, great taste, great packaging, food delivered hot. And if it's cold, it should be delivered cold, right? Value, obviously, right? Whatever you are paying, you want the highest quality and the highest and as much quantity as possible. And convenience. A lot of you mentioned speed of delivery, uh, ordering convenience. Whatever you want to order, it should be the first thing showing up instead of you needing to, you know, open the app and type. So these are the things: selection, quality, value, and convenience that we believe are never going to change, and therefore all our focus is here. And I'm going to talk about the emerging technologies focused on these four pillars: selection, quality, value, and convenience. When it comes to selection, you know, how do we integrate technology and get you to order food that you want the fastest? For example, if you are a vegetarian, the moment you open an app, there is no point of showing you non-vegetarian options. Artificial intelligence is allowing us to be, you know, to be able to predict exactly what you want based on what you ordered the last few times and what you browse through the last few times. At Rebel, for example, we have a brand called Behrul Biryani and we have a brand called Aman Story Pizza. 
if we know that you've been ordering amatsuri pizza always uh, and vegetarian uh, pizza then when you open mehru's the first few option that you will see are going to be the vegetarian options our aim is that instead of 6 minutes of ordering time that a customer takes after opening the app that number should keep reducing to 5 minutes 4 minutes 3 minutes with amazon alexa now it has become possible for you to just say like you know alexa just order two biryanis for me and it the order gets placed immediately so selection is focused the technology is focused on making it faster and faster and easier for you to order earlier we had to pay in cash now we have to you know we just put our cvv otp and it's done right so selection and ordering convenience emerging technologies are making it much and, you know more and more easier for you to order uh, if we look at you know how people order typically this is how it happens and these are some of the brands that we have so people order you know either regular meals or indulgent meals they order single serve or for friends families and colleagues so on weekend watching an india versus australia match or you know um, if you have friends at home you would not worry about uh, you know whether it's a, a 200 rupee meal or a 300 rupee meal you would want your guests to have the have the maximum fun so pizza and biryanis get ordered there but when you are at home or you are at work and it's just a quick lunch that you want then you don't want to spend more than 150 to 200 so we as consumers also keep changing uh, in terms of what we are ordering sometimes we want to order just a simple 100 rupee you know idli sometimes we want to order 600 rupees also right so as uh, as a restaurant chains we need to understand what you will order at what point in time and that becomes important if you are if it's a weekday lunch i don't want to show you options of biryani and pizza because i know that you're not going to order that we will show you the options for simple meals right that we know that you're going to order so we have to keep traversing with the customer on this depending on the time of the day what we expect the customer is going to order um considering the paucity of time i will move quickly but our app called eat show has all of the options and now what we have done is now you can order from multiple brands in a single order which on swiggy and zomato you have to choose different brands for different orders and three different delivery boys will come so this is some of the work that we are doing so that technology allows you to get food from different restaurants in a single order delivered by a single person next comes quality very important point food safety how do you know that you know something which is coming to your doorstep is actually safe and a lot of work actually goes in that food is actually one thing the value trust the restaurant so much and in case of a cloud kitchen that you don't even see you are trusting the guys in that kitchen to make the food that you are going to consume you know that's as high level of trust as anything uh, that can be right because you don't want to fall ill the next day or you don't want anybody else that you ordered for to have any sort of issue so food safety temperature control these are areas in which there is a lot of work happening the government is doing a lot of work fssa as the food safety authority you know there have a whole team of inspectors and those inspectors have also started using a lot of technology so they can go to a, a, a restaurant direct into the kitchen take some photos you know uh, through temperature under through understanding what is the temperature of the food they can shut the restaurant right there and and i think the amount of work which has happened there is great and it's important because you might have heard about lot of cloud kitchens which have come up where uh, hygiene and quality has is not taken care of as much as it should be so some some very important work there we do a lot of this but i'll i'll skip it considering the paucity of time inventory management is something i'll spend 30 seconds on see in case of a restaurant once the food is prepared either it is ordered and consumed by the customer or it goes goes waste right so for restaurant chains like us it's very important to predict that today in let's say my kitchen in kanot place how many biryani orders are going to come in lunch time how many of those are going to be chicken biryani orders how many veg biryani so that i can keep them ready and ship them out as fast as possible and that is where again technology comes in in terms of forecasting in terms of how much raw material to order how much to make so that my wastage goes down to zero and at the same time i don't get stocked out also so it's a very fine balance it's not something like inventory that i can you know like mobile phones that i can keep and i can keep selling for the next 6 months i have to be right by sku by our by kitchen and we are doing this for 350 kitchens uh, across 10 brands three times a day so that is where a lot of technology comes in to to make it possible to balance wastages versus stockouts and inventory management becomes very crucial some of the work we've done on heated food delivery bag so that you know food gets delivered to you at around 75 degrees as compared to 50 degrees that these heated uh, bags are not used 
is another great example of uh, technology being used in the in the kitchen and delivery space. Value, price, you know, we, we all want the best offers. We all want 50% off up till 100. Uh, when we are ordering, we want buy to get one. So how do cloud kitchens add value? As you would know, you know, cloud kitchens are not customer facing uh, restaurants. You can only order on delivery, so they'll not be on the on the front street, they'll be on the back street. They'll not be on the ground floor, on the first floor, even on the first floor, not in the front of the building, but on the back of the building. So that is where we reduce our rents from 20% for the industry to 5%, and we trans transfer that value to the customer. And that's why food ordering is becoming more and more popular, because you often get the same food, but cheaper on delivery as compared to going to a restaurant and ordering, right? I'll quickly cover convenience. This is this is how food ordering has really changed, you know, across uh, the last few years. All of us would order food even 10 years back, right? But we would call the local restaurant, tell them what to order. They will send a guy. We will need to have the cash ready with us. And then often we would not get the right things that we ordered. If you now look at how it has happened, you know, you open the app, you browse and you order. You don't need to talk to anyone. Food preparation takes about five minutes. Pick up by the rider takes about two minutes and delivery about 16 minutes. So it's about a 30-35 minute cycle and this is reducing. If you remember 10 years back, it would take an hour for your food to get delivered. Domino's was one of the first ones to pioneer 30 minute delivery. Now 30-35 minute delivery has become the norm. And technology again, all of these emerging technologies from order preparation, uh, from ordering to preparation to delivery are being enabled by technology. Now you can actually track the rider, right? Five years back, you wouldn't be able to track the rider, and this is enabled by riders carrying those phones with them, uh, and for you to be sure that okay, my food is food is on the way. So these are the some of the things that I wanted to cover. All of this results in customer getting a better and better experience, and more and more customers moving from going to the restaurant to you know actually ordering in. Obviously, this is not going to really really change how uh, you know how uh, people actually consume food if you're going out with your family you will go out if that's an experience but if it's convenient then you will probably order in but technology is enabling all of this so again just to wrap up some something will never change selection quality value and convenience but technology is helping us enhance it if any of you are budding entrepreneurs in the cloud kitchen space or in the restaurant space this is the email address of, uh, of launcher at doublefoods.com you know you can reach out to us we can help you become uh, a successful entrepreneur in the cloud kitchen space. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rahul. And also, the, the delivery time has been reducing. We are still working on it to getting it reduced. That is a great assurance for all of us. Um, now, uh, we have uh, Mr. Ankur Jain, who would be speaking about uh, a bit on blockchain and also how emerging technologies are helping us for uh, food traceability because I agree that we all believe in brand. We know that when we are buying it from Superstore, we are paying uh, a premium value. The food is bound to be okay. But there is a lot which happens from producer to aggregator. And that missing link is something which a consumer is never aware of. So um, putting uh, the traditional ledgers would not fill up that area. It would always be a gray area for a consumer and we would not know what are we really paying for. And uh, it becomes more and more uh, a touchy topic when we are paying for organics. We are paying premium, we are getting ordinary, we are paying premium, we are getting unhealthy, we are paying premium and we are getting a mixed up. So uh, putting the things on blockchain actually uh, in, ensures a highest level of transparency, immutability, and then not only to a consumer, but also to the back end when it comes to smart contracts and paying to the right stakeholder at the right time. So I, I request Mr. Angul Jain to make a presentation. Do you have a presentation? All right. So we, we request him to share his views uh, on how emerging technologies and particularly blockchain is helping us for having a safe Thank you, sir. Thank you. So I think uh, me being a technology person in this panel on emerging technology, I think there's some just as a time to go on, on, on explaining the need of technology. So food processing is food manufacturing, right? It's a manufacturing process. Yeah. Process. India is the second largest producer of food globally. Do you know where are we on the hunger index? Yeah. Okay, let's 
it's not just the exact number, but yeah, very, very uh, down. Uh, I think we are at the point at the bottom. So this being the topmost producer and being there at the bottom of the hunger index, what it, what explains this? Supply chain efficiency, that's it, right? Inefficient supply chain, right? From producer to uh, transporter to uh, the processors and the other distributors. Supply chain efficiency. Now let me give you the answer also. In US, um, every dollar spent on food, just 11 cents go to on farm activities. 90% of the money is going in post farm activities. Which are those? Processing, cold chain, transportation, right? So I think we have the problem, which is second largest producer and right at the bottom of the hunger index and give the solution where more investments need to go into food processing infrastructure, okay? So just producing more in this highly inefficient chain is not the solution, okay? Uh, we have to solve food processing through technology and I think th why this is a very opportune movement for India to solve a lot, lot of its problems, um, the few emerging technologies that Dr. Tagore talked about. Let's first talk about uh, IoT. What is IoT? Internet of Things, right? So if the, how you went to a local vegetable seller and inspected a cabbage, if there's an IoT system, you can do that for you, right? And imagine that those systems throw the supply chain, right? From the producer to the uh, processor to the distributor to the retailer, right? So rather than human inefficiencies, we are talking about technology driven efficiencies where the grade of the vegetables, the poultry, all that starts getting digitized and controlled by technology. That is IoT. Okay. <coughs> now, I think there's a lot of young crowd here. Um, how you go and perceive the quality of a vegetable versus how your grandmother did? Is there a difference? What's, what's the difference because of? Yeah. Yeah. So th they have they had access to those years of data, right? Right. So the first part as I told you, if everything starts pumping data to the cloud, that's IoT. Okay. Now every cabbage out there in India, the data is available in the cloud. You train an AI model and deploy it pan India. That's your grandmother's learning through working throughout the country. That's artificial intelligence. Okay. Intelligence created artificially, okay? But prior to that, the require, requisite is tremendous large amounts of data. All the combination of all the grandmothers and moms on, in this country or in the world, okay? Uh, so that is artificial intelligence, okay? You have systems which can take data and then you have systems where AI models which is intelligence uh, artificially created can be deployed and they can take decisions. So if uh, Raghav has to purchase maybe uh, uh, poultry, then he, AI model can tell him which vendor is giving the right poultry quality, right? Which vendor is giving the right dairy quality, okay? So uh, that's how modern food processing businesses, Rebel is one of the most modern food processing businesses, and that is how they are able to scale up. And that's true for everybody be it Healthy Rams or McDonald's, so any leading brand you take up of. I think they have been able to solve this problem of inefficiency. The third is blockchain. What is blockchain? Yeah, I think practically, like in our homes, uh, your mom or grandmother knows when did the vegetable came in and by when was the gravy prepared and by when do you have to eat it, right? You know the vendor, you know the processing time, you know the shelf life all that in a, in a single mind. So just having that uh, ledger technologically enabled, that's blockchain. It's a fancy word, but it's basically that ledger digitally being available where all the information is non-corruptible. Okay? You can't alter with that information. I think blockchain has been highly glamorized for crypto, but I think that's where the use lies in traditional traceability that is needed in food. It's a very strong use case, okay? So I think these are, I think uh, AI, um, IoT, and blockchain, these are technologies which are enabling 
food inefficiencies, food quality issues to be taken care of. Have you wondered that, I think uh, there are a lot of food brands globally, but why there are not enough food brands from India? Global food brands, I think, again, there, there are a few coming up. But why, why McDonald's is an exception from US? What could be the reason? Okay, what else? Okay. So I think yeah, the answer is partially right and partially wrong because I think the fast food players of the world made people believe that only fast food can be made fast. Okay, your traditional nutritious food cannot be made fast, right? I think you have ever seen the menu of something which is scaled up, highly reduced menu size, very consistent throughout the globe, right? So I think uh, yeah, down there in the West, I've been to US <coughs> and I think sandwich and burger, very standardized offerings, are standard lunch and dinner cuisines, okay? And, and they are very standard things which are very easily scalable. Now, talking about geography like India, I think the taste changes with every 50 miles, right? Uh, what we eat in a state called Haryana uh, will be very different from what we eat in a state called Punjab and those two are neighboring states, okay? Do you think a manufacturer who decides to scale up Makke Ki Roti and Sarasuga Saad, it's an Indian dish uh, uh, popular in winters, does it, will he find the volume to drive efficiencies in a way like McDonald's drives? <coughs> right or no? He doesn't have the volume, right? So, uh, so that's the second problem why this uh, food processing has remained unsolved till now and why we are standing at a very strong moment because food processing is a lot of micro industries, which is micro manufacturing spread in a larger geographies. Food is perishable and it cannot be stored and traveled, right? Anything apart from food, be it your mobile phone, be it your, um, I would say clothes, garments, those don't have a perishable life, okay? So the diversity of the food and the shelf life of the food make a very large concentrated manufacturing impossible. So when you have these distributed micro manufacturing centers, when you have these distributed micro manufacturing centers, the technologies which sit inside a McDonald's become unviable. Okay. The technology will sit inside a mega plant at Haldirams become unviable. That's indeed a very interesting perspective, uh, Uncle. Uh, uh, we, we really got very enlightened when you spoke, when you connected IoT to a uh, very basic Makeki Roti Sarsamasa. And uh, definitely winter is coming in and today's weather is a uh, buzzing alarm for Delhi winter. You know, smog, we have, uh, this gives us a bit that, okay, if smog is there, if Parali is there, Makeki Roti is also there. So uh, thank you so much for giving us the taste of uh, future food of Makki Roti with the IOT flavor on that. So with that, uh, we have uh, uh, Mr. Sunil Narva with us, who is the CEO of Food Industry Capacity and Skill Initiative. So just uh, to again connect the dots, we had a view from a government point of view and the regulators point of view about food industry. And then we had how cloud kitchens are working, how Startup India can provide you a platform and then how IoT becoming more and more imperative, how blockchain and artificial intelligence becoming more and more imperative. But you have everything in order. What is missing is the skill. When you want to plan big, when you want to have a big show running, you definitely need talented people, skilled people. You need people who know the technology. So where does it come from? Who's teaching it? Who's really making an effort? So we have Mr. Sunil Varva who would be uh, sharing a presentation and sharing his views about how his organization is making a headway in connecting the food technology institutes uh, spread across Pan India to provide them skills to, to develop a capacity building platform. Mr. Varva, we have... Thank you, you very much. Hello, Audubon. Thank you for supporting this initiative. And our primary focus is on creating better skills and future skills. 
Now you may be wondering what is happening in the food processing space. We talked of cloud space, uh, the cloud kitchen just now. We talked of AI. We talked of blockchain. So there is a transformation which is happening, and this transformation is happening because of two reasons. One is innovation, innovation from all kinds of sciences. So there is a packaging, material science innovation. There is innovation which is in logistics, on uh, cold storage. So many innovations are happening. Those innovations also impact us. Because when we talk of AI and blockchain, these are basically IT innovations, which food processing is also picking up. Secondly, we see the consumer trends. Uh, we, we just heard uh, Raghav talk about how people are ordering uh, on, from a cloud kitchen, how the apps are being used. We haven't discussed how we go on Amazon and we order our staples and we order food. And uh, the Blinkit, the Blinkit which makes available food uh, for, for your kitchen, you know, and it comes within uh, 10 to 12 minutes. So there is so much stuff which is happening all around us and this will continue to increase. Let me be uh, very clear because when we talk of startups, startups also need space, so they will also innovate. And this entire uh, space is going to become highly, highly transformative. That's the word I would use. The last time transformation happened, which I recall in my life, is when Tetra Pak came. When Tetra Pak came, suddenly milk was not a perishable commodity. It had a shelf life of one year. So that was transformative. So we are at that uh, start of a transformation of food processing industry where two things are going to happen. One thing is India is going to become the supplier of food to the rest of the world. That's something which is very evident, number one. Number two, we are having the largest middle class in the world and we will be the third largest economy in the world. So we will eat more, we will have a more variety of food before us, we will choose better quality products. So all those things would mean that food processing industry would be transformative. So the food technologists who are here in this room and other businessmen who are here, you have to first understand one thing is that unless and until you accept the fact that your degrees have a value of only five years and continuing education, continuing skilling is the answer because there is no way that you can learn everything about everything which is going to be applicable for the next 25 years when you are working. So you need to have continuing education as one of the important aspects. So we as FICSI, we are investing in the learning management system which makes available short modules which working executive can pick up new technologies, have better understanding of it. Now for example, in FICSI we have an LMS, you can go, go to it and see we have plant food technologist job role which is basically smart proteins or vegan meat. So how do you manufacture that? What is the uh, ingredients required? What are the raw materials required? What are the machineries required? So we have a course which we are running. Similarly, price fortification is something which is very dear to the heart of our Prime Minister because the women folk and even men suffer from anemia. So rice is now becoming a carrier of iron and folic acid, which means rice fortification is going to happen in rice uh, starting from 2024, it's already started happening. And also other foods, which is you know, basically staples, salt is also fortified. So rice fortification will take various forms. We have a program of rice fortification technician, for which also an online program is available. It is meant for people who are busy, who want to understand how new technologies are working, what are the new developments. So I would really encourage, first of all, the busy executives to accept the fact that they have to continue to learn. And they have to accept the fact that they are the doctors of the food world. <coughs> doctors always have to keep updating themselves regarding medicines, regarding new equipment. <coughs> so same thing is applicable for the food technologists because the way things are and the way things are going to shape up, they'll have to know more and more and more. What we are we are now going, we are now proposing <coughs> to the government is because we are authorized uh, uh, you know certifying body by National Council of Vocational Education and Training is to integrate the requirements of the industry into our course curriculum. So the industry can float, for example, there could be a course for which is supported by Revell Foods, 
dominoes and others who are into cloud kitchens to come up with a program for management of cloud kitchens which can be rolled out to people who are not necessarily engineers, people who are maybe normal graduates or even 12th class class, who can then do this program and they could be certified workforce for the cloud kitchen. So that's a project which is you know, on for us, we are already working on it and we already rolled us so 400, 500 people have already gone into that, uh, into that space and we are doing a pilot. So these are some of the initiatives which will have to be put in which means the industry will have to give its requirement. We as an organization will integrate that in, and make it into a, a curriculum. That curriculum can then be rolled out at various locations, at institutes, at training centers, and colleges. Lastly, but not the least, something for the teachers. Because if you are teaching food technology, and you believe you have done enough in your PhD, which was submitted in 2002, you are highly mistaken. So, we as an organization feel that the next stage that we have to take is to look at the competencies and skill development of the teachers who are teaching in reputed institutions, how we can continue to increase their capability, their knowledge. So that's a work in progress which will take some time to shape up, but we are very much committed to it. And I would like to conclude to say that if India has to become the supplier of food to the world and the question was asked that why no brands are available from India. I have one very simple answer to that, that the world does not trust our food. Only Basmati rice from India goes in large quantity, rest we don't have made in India brands, but they trust our pharmaceutical products. They will have uh, pharmaceutical products made in India but they don't have our food because they believe that we don't do our food production hygienic care. That is the problem. So unless and until we understand this and we actually create an environment uh, which will come through food safety cadre, which means that professionals who are committed to food safety and food audits and we continue to understand what food, what food supply systems are, how food has to be produced, that quality angle in terms of handling food has to be brought in which also is requires skilling. So we are working with FSSCI, we have programs which are running, we have skilled almost about uh, 80,000 people on the food handling systems, how food has to be handled hygienically, stored hygienically, distributed hygienically. So this is one, uh, I would say, a kind of a uh, initiative which will continue to increase because if India was to become an export hub, that's the primary thing we have to do. We have cheap raw materials, we have all the talent available, but we do not know how to handle things hygienically. And as I was told uh, by my co-panelist Raghav Joshi that there are these dark cloud regions also which are there. When, when people say dark, I know that there are some corners of the world where people will cook something and give, and I'm not sure that they actually uh, provide quality, and I'm not sure that I, I, I probably not buy that. So similarly, if somebody sitting in New York, Will that person buy a frozen meal made in India? Probably not. So we have a long way to go. So this requires building up competencies, building up skills, and understanding that food technology by itself is not a discipline. You need to understand physics, chemistry, IT, material science. It is cross-functional. And that is what the challenge is. So the students who are here in this room must understand that you can't just say that you are exporting food science, you must know a lot about other things. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I can speak a lot more on it. <laughs> and we can also command nourishment. These are like buzzwords of today. There, I don't think there is anybody whom I know who do not use these words. And this is not a good point to talk about. So, and then we are the, we are the nation where food is a religion. I mean, we, we Thrice a day, come what may, we believe in food. Food is a social binder. Food is everything what we breathe in and out. So here, if we have to connect the things and then if we question ourselves on technology, if we question ourselves on quality, then I think it's, it's the right time to sit across the table and think, where are we missing out the point? We have had a discussion from the best of the industry. We have had the discussion from the people who started from scratch and then built their own empire only riding on the horse of quality and committed to development. 
So uh, just extracting a bit of uh, each one's point, I would uh, sum up this session by saying that uh, skill development is the primary thing. We have to have people who know exactly what do we mean by food, what do we mean by food technology and how do we take it as a market commodity. The processed pre-prepared consumable food as we have processed pre-prepared wearable garments, we have processed pre-prepared wearable electronics, the same way we should have processed pre-prepared consumable food. And that is going to save a lot of time, that is going to save a lot of food wastage also, because cooking at one place have a very controlled inventory, has a very controlled way of food, cooking things, whereas individually it just gets micromanaged and things are wasted. This is not an era of food wastage. So the skill is something where we are grossly lacking. So skill development at all stages, starting from university scholar to a faculty member, an industrialist, or to a, a regulator. Everybody <coughs> needs to brush up their skill. Uh, then uh, the deployment of these trained manpower, we should not lose them. Rather, we should catch them young. Because at a very young age, they have understood ins and outs of the trade. So catch them young and then deploy them for creating something great, something phenomenal, something which has a national brand. And after that, once we have it, we contact uh, Startup India or our national government programs like this, who would facilitate, who would give us enough platform and enough visibility, enough validation. Whatever we are doing, we have somebody watching and then also guiding us. And then last but not the least, we have uh, regulators and government who would speak our point, across the nations who would, who would speak our point, go into MOUs and agreements, cross-border trades, transboundary agreements for making the food accessible in each and every part of the world. When we say food accessible, I'm sure all of you would agree that being a very rich country in terms of food diversity and consumption, we, India as a nation has never closed it, its eyes uh, towards the nations which are food uh, spares like Somalia, you know, like East Horn of African countries, we had always been there for them. And every piece we save here, every piece we process nicely, hygienically, safely, we also aim to provide them food at a very low cost. The world should not sleep hungry. That is a very important point. And if it should not sleep hungry, it should draw more and more health points from the food. So uh, emerging technologies definitely play a very big role in the coming time and the, the knock we hear it right now as Raghav had very clearly mentioned in his presentation how IoT and AI is enabling so much of efficiency in your food choices, food production, processing, delivery, so on and so forth. So reduction of time, enhancement of quality and diversity in our platter, that is what we all aim for. Uh, with that, I thank each one of you for your time and for your patient listening. If anyone of you, if you have a question for our panelists, please let us know. Yes, please. Please understand, everything cannot be taught in isolation. Any food production technology is available in technology providers. But the CFTI in Mysore, I try to contact them, but there is no, uh, uh, it is not encouraging. Uh, there is no uh, uh, availability of the transfer of technology. It is not encourageable. Let's see, if you, are, if you are, I don't know what scale of uh, enterprise you want to run. Uh, we have a scheme in the Ministry of uh, Food Processing, which is uh, formalization of micro enterprises where there is also technology transfer is also usage. Mm -hmm. If you're looking at uh, small and work, small business, then that is the scheme to look at. But I would encourage you to look at, um, uh, you know, connect up with uh, national. Yes, whether it is some kind of policy is managed or we are thinking to develop that digital disability will be implemented in all the aspects of this food. That policy I'm not aware of, but digital transfer. If you talk about digital traceability, it is possible to use a QR code on your packaging, on your package which will tell you when the product was produced, what was the uh, temperature uh, at that point in time, where was it stored, what was the temperature which was maintained in that cold storage. <coughs> it can go to an extent you can say from which farm was the tomato company or a... Uh, the private as well, I can see, you can say if it was a private, the no, but, uh, by the government. On the cooperative side, they have to disclose, they can't... Uh, and even the, the private people are supposed to disclose because that is the bill order. 
oh, they are overwhelmed by food production. So our food production is bang on target, there is no problem at all. But then when it comes to availability, uh, we have people who do not have food available, either from monetary point of view or from dietary point of view or from location point of view. The, the particular food, and when I say food, please read nutrition as well. That particular nutrition is not available to them. Then similarly, if, if the nutrition is available to them, the major uh, alarming part about malnutrition is the urban malnutrition, where uh, the children of very well-earning parents are also malnourished because of the choices of food, the food they make. It is not a grandmother's platter always that you have a balanced meal. People want to go with a quick bite, people want to go with a fast food, a dry food, whenever there is a comparison with why do you prefer burger over an Indian dosa? The, the response what we get is burger is dry, it's clean, it's easy to carry rather than dosa would have sambar and chutney and it's, it's, a, it's a whole thing which come together. So that ease of consuming, but then it is transmutation. We, we are not calculating nutrition when we are consuming ease. And then uh, among all these, the worst hit is the poor because neither he can financially afford it nor he can afford it in terms of nutrition. If you have a choice to make, most of us would make a choice of ease of uh, purchase rather than uh, a nutrient meal. If we have to just click upon our phone and get three burgers with a single click, we all would go for that rather than we would wait outside a traditional food restaurant and see if they are making it nicely. So food availability is not uh, directly, particularly in our country, not directly linked with food not available. If food consumption and then utilization Nutrition comes at the very personal level of food processing. Your body processes it and then give you nutrition. So uh, our bodies, Asian bodies, are uh, processing, genetically are processing uh, nutrition from very different types of grains, like millets, like ethnic vegetables. But over the past 50 years, 60 years, we have switched or merged our food habits with the Western world. Like our breakfast are mostly cornflakes. But our breakfast are not makki ki roti ever. We never eat makki ki roti for breakfast, but then we are eating cornflakes for our breakfast. Corn is not processed in the morning. I mean, our systems are not tuned to it. Our, our, our systems are tuned to processing something lighter, let us say millet or milk or, uh, you know, parathas like this. And then suddenly a complex carbohydrate like uh, corn comes in on the table. We feel it's light, it is easy, available, it is dry, I, it is just on my go. But then we immediately throw nutrition out. So malnutrition index is uh, just a window to show that uh, the food is less. It, there is a whole big picture which says that food is available, people can buy it. It's just either they are not making the right choices or they are not making a regular right choice. Eating burger one or day, will, will, it never kills anybody. But if you're regularly eating burger and then uh, slashing your balanced meat out, then the, uh, the malnourishment index, you find the place there. So it is more, you know, we have taken food out from a cultural perspective. Food was always cultural for us. Now we have made it very official or very, uh, we have commoditized the food. As long as food is a commodity on the shelf store, we will always be malnourished, we will always have health issues because we have taken the complete food out of the platter. This is just a personal postulate, but let us hear from what other panelists also have to say. Uh, second point that we are highest at the global hunger index. So there again two parts comes to it. One is what Ma'am mentioned is the nutrient values to what we are producing, uh, which is very low. And that is also one of the reasons that we are not even among the top 10 exporters uh, compared to food and food processing products. The second factor is basically there is a very big uh, rich and poor divide in the country and that has been increasing. So as food is commodity, it is not affordable to the particular section of the society and hence, uh, you know, that is the reason why we are highest as the hunger, hunger index. So in order to solve this problem, the, the main, we have, to, uh, we have to solve the core issue of bridging the gap of uh, the income divide that is there, which is leading to this issue. And with more equality and equal options, then probably, you know, we can see that, you know, our, we, we are better at the hunger, hunger index. And also at the same time, improving the nutrient value will put us among the top exporters uh, among the globe. So, I would like to analyze or summarize it in this manner. Yeah, I think in um, addition to, I don't have answers on policy, but uh, I think there are a few major infrastructural changes that are happening. 
happening in India, which are enabling this food security to be a lot more better, like um, the express trains that are getting built, the dedicated transport hubs that are getting built. So if you want to travel, uh, maybe you produce apples in Shimla and you want to get it to Mumbai, right? Uh, the cold chain infra is one issue, but you can also solve it by enabling a better uh, dedicated logistics corridor. So uh, I think uh, it's a combination of infra, cold chain infra, uh, combination of uh, how can you, how fast can you process uh, the apples or the tomatoes when they're produced into a non-perishable uh, form. And third is the, uh, I think, infra between the produce and the demand. So these three is where I think there's a lot of work happening that we see. And I think uh, that's where uh, we hope that uh, this bridge can be reduced. See, there is also, also been giving advisories to process food manufacturer to use less salt, less oil, less sugar. So that is already on and people have what if you eat lays now you find less salt in it than what it used to be earlier. Sugar content also has been reduced. So these stipulations have happened. Secondly, you look at the way millet, uh, millets have uh, grown in this country, the consumption has grown, the demand has increased. It's because of government announcements. Then I spoke about rice fortification because rice fortification is a campaign where all PDS rice has to be fortified with iron so that it can take care of anemia. So all these small, small steps are happening, but lastly but not the least, we may in our PDS give the grains, but we don't give proteins. Proteins are very necessary for human health and we are really short in consumption of protein. So to answer your question, economic prosperity will drive the consumption of proteins. Even dals have become very expensive. And uh, lastly, but not the least, it is the individual's choice. Whether I decide to go to the gym or I decide to have gulab jamuns every morning is my decision. So whether I need to have burger or I need to have balanced meat is my decision. The government cannot dictate it. Government can give the overarching infrastructure, can make available various information, can make available products. But ultimately, it is me who has In the 2023 event. Uh, in today's thematic session on uh, edible oils and fats, we have an exciting, exciting panel across, from across the board. And I'm sure this is going to be something that you will take away from this meeting today. Uh, I welcome the moderator, Dr. Shripa Vora, and other guests to take over the panel and carry the session forward. Thank you.